The scripture reading this evening comes from 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 6 to 10 Therefore humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you be of sober spirit be on the alert your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour but resist him firm in your faith knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world after you have suffered for a little while the god of all grace who called you to his eternal glory glory in christ will himself perfect confirm strengthen and establish you now as christians it is important that we know our enemy and whether we want to believe it or not we are in a spiritual war satan has declared war on you he's declared war on indeed every child of god he has made it his mission to destroy each and every one of us he has pointed his weapons directly at you and his objective is to destroy your soul he is a formidable foe and therefore we had better have a strategy a strategy to be able to face him or we risk certain spiritual death one of the oldest books in the world on military strategy is the art of war by sun tzu written in the 6th century bc this chinese military uh, composition is made up of 13 chapters each dealing with a particular aspect of warfare it has long been praised as the definitive work on military strategy and tactics of its time and it influences military leaders even to this current moment in time among the numerous insights found in the book are these verses which read so it is said that if you know your enemies and know yourself you will fight without danger in battles if you only know yourself but not your opponent you may win or lose if you know neither yourself nor your enemy you will always in danger yourself you know we must know our enemies our enemy we must know his schemes we must know his tactics we must understand what his objectives are and what his plans are in regard to our lives first peter chapter 5 verse 8 as was just read just a moment ago peter says be sober of spirit be on the alert your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour but then he says but you must resist him we must be active you know it's not just a matter of running away it is a matter of resisting the devil ignorance is costly when it comes to battling our adversary we must know what we're up against paul writes in second corinthians chapter 2 verses 10 through 11 But one whom you forgive anything I forgive also for indeed what I have forgiven if I have forgiven anything I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan for we are not ignorant of his schemes You see Paul says I understand how he works and I'm going to do those things that enable us to prevent him from accomplishing his goals by doing the by giving him free reign to do the things that he wants to do. We cannot afford to be ignorant of the devil's schemes. We cannot, you know, ignorance is going to uh result in a defeat in the battle against Satan and knowing our opponent is vital. 
But knowing yourself is important as well. Remember what Sun Tzu said. He talked about knowing your enemy. But he also says, if you know neither yourself nor your enemy, you will always be in danger. We had better be aware of our weaknesses. What entices us? The lust that exist in our hearts, those temptations that we struggle with so that we can address those things, so that we can shore up those areas of weakness against attack. I mean, the military commander has to look at where his, how his own position is set up and understand what the weaknesses of his position might be. And we had better do that for our lives as well. You bet we must know ourselves because Satan certainly knows us. He knows my weaknesses. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your tendencies. He knows how to tempt you. He knows where you are unprotected. He knows how to attract you to things that can cause you to stumble. But he also knows that you have the strongest, that you have the most powerful and most perfect weapon at your disposal. You are a part of an army that can never be defeated so long as you follow the commander. When God is on your side, you will always win. And of course, being a Christian doesn't automatically exclude you, though, as a target. Satan's darts still will be hurled in your direction because defeating a Christian is the sweetest victory that Satan can ever have. And knowing as much as we can about our enemy, while that is vital in the war for our souls, and we understand and we know that we need to gather as much information as we can from God's Word, we need to study His tactics. God's Word shows us the devil, shows us how he works. We must also then, after understanding those things, put on that whole armor of God that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 6. But we can do one more thing as well. We can put ourselves in His shoes. We can try to look at the world through His eyes and ask, if I were the devil, what would I do? A lot of our military leaders over the years, they engross themselves in their opposition's world so that they can understand how they think. And it behooves us to do something of that, of that type of thinking when we look at this. So I want to give you a few things that I was thinking about that if I were the devil. If I were the devil, I would try and separate you from the rest of the Lord's army. To, as in military parlance, to divide and conquer. To separate you out so I can defeat you in detail. I would try to separate you out. Now the easiest and the quickest way and the way that many fall in this category is to not be involved in the Lord's church. To not get to know your family, not become a part of the group. To not be at services. Those are all the things that are very easily separate a person from the army of the Lord. Leaves them out there unprotected. You know, when you see uh, the lions hunting, you know, the devil being like a lion, you see the lions hunting, they, they don't run after the animals that, right in the middle of the herd, do they? They're after that one that straggles off out here by itself. The one that gets itself separated from the herd. And that's exactly what the devil wants to do. Not only would I do that from a standpoint of attending services, I would try and destroy your confidence in the church as a way of separating you away from it. I would try to destroy your confidence in those that are in positions of leadership. Soldiers must have confidence in their leaders if they're going to be effective fighters. And the devil will do everything that he can to erode the confidence that we have in our ordained leaders. The devil knows that an eldership dedicated to God's Word to God's purposes and God's people is very dangerous for His desire to destroy us individually and to destroy us as the church. Men are appointed by the Holy Spirit to be elders because they are a special group of men who have demonstrated spiritual maturity, humility, 
biblical knowledge, leadership, and a conviction to stand for those things that are right and true. And the devil must destroy such men, or simply, if he can't destroy them, he will do everything that he can to destroy their influence and to cause people to become jaded in some way. The devil will cause people to become fixated on their desires instead of God's. And at that point, those people will attack elders in order to get what they want. I have unfortunately seen this happen many times in the church over 30 years. And it is the reason why the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. You know, the writer of Hebrews is saying that it is not good for us to usurp or to cause problems for those that have authority over us. They are there for a reason. They have, as we mentioned before, the spiritual maturity, the biblical knowledge, the leadership, and the conviction to be able to lead us in a way that God would have us to go. And God has chosen them to watch over our souls. And they answer to Him. No elder answers to Nathan. No elder answers to any of you. But they will one day answer to God. And they understand that. And it's not our place to oppose them except when they leave God's will. That would really be the only narrow exception. To oppose them is to create a problem that they have to deal with. Now let me, let me explain to you. And a lot of times, a lot of things that elders are, are given and are thrown at them, and, and, and you know, most members of the congregation never see these things. But oftentimes they are things that are just problems that they don't really need on their plate. They really aren't necessary. And yet when these problems are thrown at them, such problems create a drain of the finite time and energy that they have to watch for our souls. The drain means that people that have serious spiritual needs get neglected because the elders can't deal with everything and do all things. They have a limited amount of ability and time. And so, if we're going to bring something to them, if we're going to do these things, we need to make certain that they are things that are important, important enough to take their time and not just things that are causing problems. And I think that's why the writer of Hebrews here in Hebrews chapter 13 says that for us to be a problem or to cause problems with the eldership or with the leadership is unprofitable for us because they're not going to be able to do the job that God wants them to do and that they want to do. Do not let Satan use you to hurt the army of God by hurting its leadership. Now the devil will also try and denigrate leadership positions of deacons and teachers to weaken the efforts of the church. These actions against the leadership discourages people throughout the church. And the discouragement will weaken some spiritually and make some easier targets for the roaring lion that's seeking something, someone to devour. So we see some of the ways that the devil can attack the influence of leadership in the congregation and as a result cause bitterness within individuals and push them out into a position where he can attack them. Second thing, if I were the devil, I would destroy the need for biblical authority. I would try and say that we can do things that are not found in the Bible as long as the Bible does not specifically say that I cannot. And in so doing, I would invalidate Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17, that all that I do in word or deed be done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. To do something in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is to do it under His authority, to do it by what He has said that I can do. And Paul even there adds the Lord Jesus Christ, adds that that word Lord there to demonstrate His authority over us to tell us when, where, and what to do. People try to destroy biblical authority because they either know very little about what the Bible teaches or they just do not care what it teaches. It comes down to that sometimes. A person who loves God and Christ 
should love what they say. Should love what they want from you. A person who does that is going to be a person that abides by biblical authority. A person who does not abide by those things that God says does not love God or Christ. First John chapter 5, verse 3, For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. And His commandments, they're not burdensome. They're not hard. God does not weigh us down with things that are so hard to do, but He gives us a life that's better. And that is a demonstration of love toward Him. We must be people that hold firmly to the Word of God because the most dangerous thing to the devil and his attacks is it is written in God's Word. That is what sends him running. When it is used to combat and to defeat him, it will win every time. Paul called such a weapon as he talked about the armor of God. He called it the sword of the Spirit. It is our weapon. It is that which we use. Do not neglect it or allow it to become dull in your life. Care for it. Work with it. Make certain that you know how to use it because it is that which is sharp and living and two-edged and it can cut through even to the hardest of hearts. Third, if I were the devil, I would sanitize sin and justify pretty much all immorality. The devil loves to make people see good as evil and evil as good. He's been doing that a a very long time. It is a tried and proven formula for destroying people and destroying nations. He used it to destroy the nation of Judah in the Old Testament. He has an army of his people trying to justify so many sins as okay today. Everything from immodest dress, drunkenness, all kinds of sexual sin, abortion, murder, pornography, and just about anything else that God's Word speaks about, I guarantee you the devil has someone out there going, that's okay. And that's all right. And it's not wrong. And who are you to say that it's wrong? Well, I'm not. Nathan's Nathan's saying it's wrong doesn't matter one bit. God says it wrong as that does matter. And so, you know, there's going that the devil is already doing that. A big portion of the devil's strategy has always been getting people to do what is right in their own eyes instead of what is right in God's eyes. For those who know those things are sin, the devil will try and convince them that they can go ahead and do those things. They can sin, and and God will just ignore it because of His grace. You know, He says that you do not really have to change your life Just, you know, as long as you're struggling, as long as you feel like it's a struggle and okay, you're okay. God's grace will will take care of that. And friends, God is not looking for someone hoping for a better life. God is looking for someone that wants a better life. A better life without sin. A better life that chooses Him. And Titus chapter 2 and verse 12 tells us that grace is about denying sinful ungodliness in order to live for God today. Grace is not about excusing us from not giving our all to the changes that we may need to make in our lives. It is amazing how the devil, the father of lies, as Jesus called him in John 8, 44, can pull the proverbial wool over our eyes and trick us into defending ridiculous things, defending evil things, like some of these things were just mentioned. He's good. And we need to open our eyes before it's too late. You know, there are others I would do, but time will not permit. And I'll just mention the titles and we won't go through them. But I think you'll understand. If I were the devil, I would remove God from the public discussion and make it almost impossible to say His name. I would remove absolutes and leave it up to every individual to do whatever they want. 
I would convince preachers to make their sermons have little substance and be nothing more than a feel-good session. I would make the church more about having fun and being a social place than about doing substantive things that accomplish the purposes of God. I would tell you that a traditional Bible-based congregation can't grow. I would do everything I could to make the next generation of the church less faithful and less knowledgeable than the one now. I would attack the family, and through doing that, I would destroy the moral fiber of society. I would promote materialism so that people would give more time to acquiring physical things and be less concerned with spiritual things. That's what I would do. And that's really what he does. There are so many that we could think about, but I want to remember this last one. If I were the devil, I would attack you. Never forget that one. Because that's just the plain truth. You're in his sights. I would point out all of your mistakes in the past. I would remind you of all your failures. I would whisper in your ear that you are good and worthy of God's forgiveness without ever needing to change anything in your life. Just keep being who you are. You're, you're all right. I would try to tell you that you will never be any better than you are right now. And I would try to get you to close your eyes to the life that God wants you to choose. A better life. One that is better because it is lived by God's direction. Well, I am very thankful I'm not the devil. <laughs> because he has no hope. And I have hope because I'm not. I am not the devil and I do not... I do want that better life for you. And I do want you to do, be better than you are right now. I want to be better than I am right now. I understand better than anyone in this room exactly where I can improve and how I need to be better. And you understand about you better than anyone in this room where you can. But those are the things you have to make honest assessments about. Choose that life guided by God. Know the enemy that seeks to destroy you. Know that he's also God's enemy. And defeat him at every opportunity in your life with the weapons that God has provided to you in his word. That and in doing so, that guarantees. It's not a if we win or hope we win. It guarantees that you win. Because Jesus has already won the victory. Am I going to be with him? He's already won. It's just a matter of whether I'm in his army or not, the winning army. It's, there's no wondering about the end. The end is set. Just whose side am I going to be on when I get there? One side set to lose and one side set to win. And I need to decide now where I want to be. This evening, if we can help you overcome the lies of Satan, we can help you in his schemes against you. We want to do that. Maybe he's been telling you, you don't need to obey the gospel. You do. And if you do and you give your life to that, you will never regret having ignored the devil and come to God. We want to help you there. If you're a child of God and maybe you've let the devil tell you things and separate you out or make you get a little distant from the church or distant from your responsibilities as a child of God, then come back today. Confess your sins and know that He's faithful and just to forgive you. If we can help you, pray with you, encourage you. We want to do that. We don't pray that you'll let us. Why don't you come as we stand and as we sing?